tonight. Last week we dealt with, uh, and that was part two, uh, part two of last week uh, we finished about evil, the problem with evil and how evil came into the world, so we thank God for that. But let us bow our hands for a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for allowing us to be in your presence. Thank you for these, your people, Father, as we come together and study your word tonight. Lord, open up our understanding that we may receive your word and be more blessed with understanding that we may be able to tell someone else about Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Bless those who are here. Bless those who wanted to be here but could not make it. And bless those who are on their way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Yes. This lesson is more, uh, when we talk about the reliability of the Bible, so we're going to talk about a lot of uh, statistics and a lot of information and then we'll turn to some scriptures so uh, we're trying to figure out is the Bible reliable for us to study it is the Bible reliable for us to say this book is the word of God how do you know that this book is the word of God how do you know that this book was written by God? It could have been written by some people who just want to, as some of the Muslims would tell you, the Bible was written to keep the black man down. The slave master wrote that book. The white man wrote it. To keep black people under oppression. I mean, that's what we, we hear some people say about the Bible. Is the Bible reliable for us to study it? Uh, there's an acronym. Now, this article I found, I found by, as you see his name there, by Hank Hanegraaff, and uh, it's called Bible Reliability Maps to Guide You Through Bible Reliability. Now, uh, MAPS is an acronym to help you understand um, how the Bible is reliable. So, of course, MAPS is going to stand, uh, M-A-P-S stands for something, M stands for manuscripts, A stands for archaeology, P stands for prophecy, and S stands for statistics. So you can use that acronym to remember that the Bible is reliable if you want to explain that to someone else. We're going to go over this acronym uh, and then we're going to look at some scriptures after that. Okay, so the first uh, letter is M, which is manuscripts manuscripts. Uh, if you look down at the bottom of page one, right, right, right where it says the bibliographic, the bibliographic test, uh, in order, and then they break down manuscripts into another acronym. In order to understand manuscripts, there's another acronym that you can use for just manuscripts by itself, and it's the B uh, acronym, B-E-E. -E. B stands for bibliographical, this is all in your lesson. E stands for eyewitnesses, and another E stands for external, because this is very important for you to understand. So manuscripts, how do we know that the manuscripts are authentic? How do we know that God wrote them? Well, looking at the bibliographic test, looking on page one, the bibliographic test considers the quantity of manuscripts and uh, manuscripts fragments and also the time span between the original documents and the earliest copies. So, when you put it in uh, layman's terms, this is what they're saying. The more copies we have of a document, the better the reliability. The less copies of documents in history that we have uh, is less, they're not that reliable. And I'll show you a chart, which is in your lesson. So my question to you is, did, did you know this? Let me ask you, because some of you may know this. Do we have an original manuscript for any one of these books in the Bible? Original manuscript. Do we have, can we find, or did somebody ever find the original? Y'all know the Bible wasn't written in English, right? You, you know that, right? So the Bible was written in, in Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek. Do we have any manuscripts out there or found, anybody found the original of any one of these books? Do we have any original books? Do we have the original Genesis that we're looking at? Okay, so y'all saying yes because you know, or yes because we're guessing. 
Well, remember, if you're going to go back to Genesis, if we have the original manuscript, let's just use Genesis for an example, that, that original manuscript would have to be, what, 4,000 years old? Four to 5,000 years old, that's when Moses would have written it. Then, uh, just to let you know, we have no, none, original uh, books of the Bible in their original form from the original writer. We don't have them at all. What we have is copies of what they have written. We have copies of what they have written. Uh, we're going to explain that too, why we have these copies. We have no original. Number one, we can't have the original because the paper would have never, or whatever they wrote on, would have never lasted that long in the first place. And as you know, in Moses' time, they copied everything. But remember, the reliability test, that's the biblical graphic test, is this first. The more manuscripts we have, the more copies we have, the better the reliability. So the more copies we have throughout history of these books of the Bible, we can compare those copies to the original, the best originals that we found. And we're going we're gonna to see some dates right here. Uh, look at the bottom. The, uh, the bottom of them, right, uh, the bottom of page one. We have more than fourteen thousand manuscripts and fragments of the Old Testament of three main types: a, approximately ten thousand from the Cairo uh, Giza storeroom found in eighteen ninety seven, dating back as far as about A.D. eight hundred. We have about one hundred and ninety. From the Dead Sea Scrolls found in 1947 through 1955, the oldest dating back to 250 to 200 BC, we have found at least 4,314 assorted other copies of the Old Testament. The, the short time between the original Old Testament manuscripts completed about 400 BC. This is what we have found over all of these fragments of just the Old Testament we have found. Uh, and we compare. So guess what? When they found these in the 1940s and 1897, when they found them, what did they compare them to? They compared them to the other copies that they had found. So all those fragments, they got together and started beginning to compare them with each other to make sure of their what? Reliability and their authenticity. The more fragments you have, or the more copies you have, the more you can bring those copies together, and if one person says this, and a thousand of them were saying something else, then you can say, okay, this person was wrong. They're trying to add something to it. So we got over almost 10,000, if not 20,000, fragments of just the Old Testament. Look at the next paragraph. The same is true with the New Testament text. The abundance of textual witnesses is amazing. We possess over 5,300 manuscripts or portions of the Greek New Testament, almost 800 uh, copied before A.D. 1000. Now, you know that the New Testament was finished writing before the end of the first century. So if we have over 1,000 copies already made, and especially at that time, I'll show you how amazing, why that is amazing that we have all these copies. The time between the original composition and our earliest copies is an unbelievable short 60 years or so. The overwhelming bibliographic reliability of the Bible is clearly evident. So the more copies we have, the better we can compare the Bible with. You're going to see a chart in a, in a minute. In other words, let me give you a perfect example. We got thousands and thousands of copies of the Old Testament and New Testament. Let me bring up a person who lived around that time who was very famous. Y'all heard know a man named Aristotle. Aristotle was a philosopher. He wrote a lot of works too. Guess how many works did they find of his? It's 2,000 years later. Eight. That's it. And I can go on. I got a list. You got a list of people in there and how much we have their works. Copies of their Because nobody has their original. We have copies of these people's writings. So once again, they only found eight. How reliable is that? When you got these copies that were found all over the world, and guess what? They are accurate when they compared them to each other. That's just the bibliographical test. Remember, this uh, manuscript has three parts to the test. The bibliographical test, then the eyewitness test. Look at point number two, the eyewitness test, the other E. 
is sometimes referred to as the internal test. Focuses on the eyewitnesses credentials of the authors. The Old and New Testament authors were eyewitnesses of or interviewed eyewitnesses of the, ma the majority of the events they described. Moses participated in and was an eyewitness of the remarkable events of the Egyptian captivity, the exodus, the 40 years in the desert, and Israel's fine, uh, final uh, encampment before entering the promised land. These events he chronicled in the first five books of the Old Testament. And we already know in the, in the New Testament writers that they were the same eyewitnesses. All the apostles were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. And we talked about this, I think, last week or two weeks ago. In order to be called an apostle, you have to be an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. So the apostles who wrote, the ones who did write, they were all eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at two passages of scriptures. Somebody turn to Luke 1. 1 to 3, and I'll turn to 2 Peter 1 16. This talks about the eyewitnesses, those who are eyewitnesses. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to turn to Luke and I'll turn to 2 Peter, and we'll see about who, who are the ones, who are the eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. So, I, I think I ran into a conversation with somebody and I asked them, How do they know George Washington lived? He's been dead for almost 200 years. How do you know Abraham Lincoln lived? We got a picture of him. Well, anybody can make a picture of somebody. How do you know he lived? We got his writings. Oh, we do have his writings. We have some of his family members may still be alive. How do you know anybody ever existed over 200, 300 years ago? You have to have some documentation somewhere. You have to have their writings. Then you've got to confirm those writings with other writings to make sure that person existed. Uh, whoever has Luke. Luke 1, 1 through 3. And I'll find second Peter. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses mm -hmm. and ministers of the world. Verse 3. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding for all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, more excellent Theophilus. Theophilus. Now, who's writing this? This is Luke, right? That's Luke. Uh, how many of you know that Luke was not a disciple of Jesus Christ? Right. Luke was not a disciple. He's not one of the twelve. Well, who was Luke? He's a physician. He's a doctor. He also wrote another book in the Bible, which is, he wrote Luke and Acts, the same person. Now, Luke is saying in verse 2, guess what? He wasn't an eyewitness of Jesus, but guess what he did when he wrote his book? Both books. He talked to those who were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. He interviewed them for his book, the book of Luke which is one of the Gospels, and the book of Acts, which really no other person ever wrote down the history of the church other than Luke. So we got that, that Luke is telling you that his eyewitnesses were that were ones who have actually seen Jesus Christ. He was just an interviewer. And of course he was a Christian as well. Now, 2 Peter, uh, this is 2 Peter 1.16, says this is by eyewitnesses. 2 Peter 1, 16, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So we're not running after stories. We're not running after fables. We're not running after uh, what we call superstitions. We were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. Christ. That's what Apostle Peter is saying. So he says, we're not making this up. We lived with him. We saw him. We saw the miracles. And they're writing down what they eyewitnessed. So number two, the test for your manuscripts is yes, we have copies, all those thousands of copies, and we have eyewitnesses according to the word of God. Look at test number three for your manuscripts. The external evidence test looks outside. So you have the bibliographical test, you have the eyewitness test, and you have the external test. Now, what is the external test? The external, external test is this. 
what do uh, what have other people written about Jesus who were not Christians? Are there writings out there in history of somebody talking about Christianity other than this, this book that you read right here? Yes, there is. If you look down at the bottom, uh, go all the way down to the bottom where it says many of many of the events. Many of the events, people, places, and customs in the New Testament are confirmed by secular historians who are almost contemporaries with New Testament writers. Secular historians like the Jewish Josephus. He was a, a historian. Uh, not Christian historian, just a regular historian at that time, before A.D. 100, the Roman Tacticus, A.D. Uh, 120, the Roman uh, Suetonius, A.D. 110, the Roman Governor Pliny, Sunutius, A.D. 100, 110, make direct, listen to this, they make direct references to Jesus or from one or more historical New Testament references. Now, why, why is that important? Those men we just mentioned, their writings are reserved. They wrote about their own history. And guess who they mentioned in their books? And these are not Christians. They mentioned Jesus Christ. So if Jesus wasn't a real person, then why would God allow unsaved folks to write about him? Not only does he have that, then we have all these manuscripts, which is the Bible, make up our Bible today. Then we have the eyewitnesses. So if anybody ever tried to challenge you that Jesus never existed over 2,000 years ago, you got to tell them history shows that Jesus existed. The Bible shows that Jesus existed existed and there were eyewitnesses saying that Jesus was a real person. He is not a figment of your imagination. He was a real human being walking on this planet. Because you know some people do believe that he wasn't real. Okay, so we got that. Now the second thing, remember the acronym MAPS. We talked about M manuscripts. Let's talk about A. Archaeology. Archaeology. Uh, turn to, to the next page, page 3. Archaeology. I only want to mention one thing for archaeology. For years, it is right that sentence, right there in the second paragraph. And it says this, for years, critics dismissed the book of Daniel, partly because there was no evidence that a king named Belshazzar ruled in Babylon during that time period. However, Later, archaeological research confirmed that the reigning monarch, Nabonius, appointed Belshazzar as his co-regent while he was away from Babylon. It was early in the 20th century. A lot of people tried to dismiss the book of Daniel. They try to argue it down because of certain names that are not mentioned in secular history. Then, this archaeologist found a stone with this king's name on it who mentions... Belshazzar. Now everybody says, oh, it's reliable. So we already know because by faith we believe the word of God, but God is always bringing out even archaeological facts that the Bible is real, that the stories that you read in the Bible are real. So that's the archaeological test. So you got the manuscripts, M, because for maps, M, A, archaeological. Then you got the P. Here's the most uh, good one too. Prophecy. Prophecy. If this don't convince you that the Bible was real, I don't know what will. Watch this. The first sentence. The third principle of the Bible reliability is prophecy or predictive ability. The Bible records predictions of events that could not be known or predicted by chance or common sense. Drop down to the middle of that paragraph. The many predictions of Christ's birth, life, and death, see below, were indisputably rendered more than a century before they occurred as proven by the Dead Sea Scrolls of Isaiah and other prophetic books as well as by the Septuagint translation. I'll tell you what Septuagint means. All dating from earlier than 100 B.C. The Septuagint. The Septuagint means this. It is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. If you want to make you a note, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. That's what he mean by Septuagint writings. So what is he saying about this? He's saying that in prophecy, there are some prophecies that, uh, that throughout the Bible that Jesus fulfilled that he could not manipulate at all. 
And if you go a little further, we're going to look at some of those prophecies. We just mentioned them because we're going to read some later. It says there's where uh, almost near the end, many of these prophecies would have been impossible for Jesus to deliberately conspire to fulfill, such as his descent from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How could Jesus pull that off? How could he, how could he oh, I'm going to set up that I'm going to be born of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Yes. Pastor, aren't there archaeologists still claiming that they're finding out? Biblical, you know, uh, stuff that's still related to that. Yes, well, you know, uh, just that, you know, the artifacts that we talked about, and just I'm glad she brought that point up, they are still even finding uh, manuscripts like, let's say, the book of Judas. Uh, they somebody found a, a tombstone that said the son of Jesus. Of course, and then people say, oh, see, Jesus couldn't have been real because he got a, 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 a tombstone talking about that was his son. It was a lot of people named Jesus. Jesus was a common name. Now, in, in Spanish, it's still a co common name today. That we can, it's the Jesus. But we get mad if you name your child Jesus. Everybody goes, why do you name your child Jesus? But no, uh, in that day, Jesus was a common name just like uh, Joshua is a common name. So there's many, even in the Bible, there's more than one Jesus even in our Bible. Jesus is not the only Jesus in the Bible. As you all know that, or Joshua in, in, in the Bible, more than one. These new archaeological findings, once again, we call them, write this word down somewhere, synoptic gospels. Some people would like to try to find some different writings. The book of Noah, the book of Judas. We don't have those books. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the Catholic Bible, they have some books in their Bible added to the 66 called the lost books. We call them the lost books of the Bible, but they're not lost books in the Bible. There's no such thing as a lost book of the Bible. They were lost for a reason. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that. Why did they choose these 66 books to make our Bible, and why didn't they include the book of Judas, and why didn't they include the book of Noah, and why didn't they include the book of Enoch, and why didn't they include some of these books that they're finding Matthew. today? Uh, what's that? Maccabees. Yeah, oh yeah, the first and second Maccabees, which is found in the Catholic Bible. Some of those books as to, that's in the Catholic Bible are historical books. They're true, but some of them are totally fables. But the Catholic Church has decided to add into the 66 books these other lost books that don't have anything to do with Christ. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Why we only have 66 books in the Bible opposed to First and Second Maccabees, the book of Judas, and Lucifer, and all that other kind of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, they find them. They find stuff that's over two thousand years old. Because what we we because I'm talking about this this Sunday about false prophets. The thing about false prophets and things about false doctrine. Yeah, the Bible says many people will come in to infiltrate the church and do it, try to destroy the church. So just like these guys wrote, other people were writing to dispute against what the Bible was saying. And these books are out there. They're two thousand years old. Like one of them is the book of Judas. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the book of Judas, it tries to say that Jesus and Judas conspired. In the book of Judas, it says Jesus and Judas conspired to put this plan together for him to portray him. And is that, that that was his plan all along. Jesus and Judas had this all set up. That's found in the book of Judas. So how do we know that that is not in this spot? How do we know that's not true? Because remember, this is why we have 66 books. Might as well tell you now. If they don't agree, if they all don't agree, it cannot be put in the Bible. There are no, not one, contradiction in the Bible. Not one. So if any other book that's found out there, if it doesn't agree with the 66, it cannot be put in there. Uh, there was another book. This is one of the lost books of the Bible that is found in the Catholic Bible. This is, a, I forgot the name of one of the books, but in one of the books, they try to tell you because our book, our Bible doesn't tell us what Jesus did between the age of 12 and 30. Because you see Jesus saying in our Bible, age 12, when his parents saw him and says, you know, did you know I was in my, I was doing my father and found him in the temple. Next time you see Jesus, he's 30 years old. Well, in one of the books of the Catholic Bible, they can tell you what he did when he was 22. They said Jesus was making clay in the dirt and turning dirt into animals. 
He was doing miracles at 15. Now, the reason we don't accept that, because no other book, no other book, not one of our 66 books will agree with that, that Jesus would show any sign of miracles before he was 30 years old. None. So they don't have any documentation to verify why they believe that. They, you know, they're real. If you, if anybody knows anything about the Catholic Church, they are very mystical people. You know, they they pray to idols, and they believe in all kinds of superstitions. And you just got to watch out when you're listening to them because they're very mystical. We're, we'll do a teaching on the Catholic Church uh, one day, but they're, they're very mystical. But here, we have these 66 books. And if these other books, no matter what book people say they found, if it don't agree with the 66 you have, you can write it right on off. Either as a historical book, like the book of Maccabees, First and Second Maccabees, which is a historical book, but the Catholics put in their Bible. Let me tell you about the book of Maccabees. The book of Maccabees tells the story of how the Jews came up with the holiday Hanukkah, which Hanukkah is the same day we celebrate uh, Christmas, which is also the same day in the book of, well, as a matter of fact, the period between Malachi and uh, Matthew, that period, is 400 years. So the, the last book of the Old Testament between the first book of the New Testament is 400 years. That's the period of the Maccabees. Because there was no prophet uh, 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 prophesying. So, but that's historical data. There was no prophecy. There was no inspired word. And in that particular time, that 400 year period, uh, there was a person by the name of Maccabees who led a revolt against the Romans to uh, stop the oppression of his people. And then, which is happened on December 25th for that two weeks, and he won. Therefore, calling that holiday Hanukkah. That's where that comes from. But any other book that you read about that does not line up with the 66 books, you can just write them totally off. They're not, they're not reliable. So once again, many of the prophecies, and I'm reading now at the bottom, many of the, the prophecies would have been impossible for Jesus to deliberately conspire to fulfill, such as his descent from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? They go to scriptures. His birth in Bethlehem. How could Jesus pull that off? I can say, okay, I'm in the womb. I want you to, I want you to uh, take me to Bethlehem because we got to make, we got to make the prophecy work. Jesus didn't tell her that, right? It was God that told uh, Joseph to take his wife, right? And then he was born in Bethlehem. Jesus did because he wasn't even a boy yet. How could he set that up? Why did that how, Now the reason we say this because his birth was predicted a couple of hundred years before his birth in Malachi and Micah five two. That's a couple hundred years before Jesus was born, that he will be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5 2. How could Jesus fit? His crucifixion. Well, with criminals found in Isaiah 53 2. Isaiah was written 200 years, 300 years before Jesus was born. How did they know that the Messiah will be born or will be crucified with criminals? Uh, the piercing of his hands and feet at the crucifixion, Psalms 22. The soldiers gambling for his clothes. Psalms 22. If you go to Psalms 22 and read Psalms 22, it tells you, you read that, you think you're reading the whole crucifixion. And then you know Psalms was written 400 years before Jesus was even born. So all of these prophecies about what the Messiah was going to go through, Jesus fulfilled. Listen to this. Jesus fulfills over 300 prophecies. That's just what he fulfilled. And there's over 300 more that got to be fulfilled. Because we gotta get we gotta get to his second coming. We gotta get to the millennial okay? All these are gonna to come to pass. So if Jesus fulfilled all of these, oh, I, I love this one. In Exodus, it says, uh, well, it, there's a prophecy about Jesus when he was born, said that Jesus would come out of Egypt. And people say, well, Jesus never came out of Egypt. Well, no, remember when because this uh, one of the prophecies says, uh, out of uh, this is in Matthew, no, it's in Genesis or the, the uh, Exodus. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. Now, where's the first place that Jesus and Joseph and Mary went when they were running from Herod? They left. Oh, no, no. When they came back, they had to go through Egypt and they stayed there. Then they went to, after he was born in Bethlehem, they left there and rested where? In Nazareth. Uh, I think it was not that you asked, wait a minute. There's no prophecy that says the Messiah will be born in Nazareth. No, it wasn't. But there was a prophecy, prophecy said that he would be born 
in Bethlehem. Yes, he was born in Bethlehem, raised up in Nazareth. But the, uh, one of the prophecies said he will be called a Nazarene. These are all prophecies that Jesus himself, as a baby, could not have fulfilled. Here's another one. Uh, got the soldiers gathered for his clothes, Psalms 22, the piercing of his side, and the fact that his bones were not broken at his death, Zechariah 10, 12 and 10, and Psalms 34 and 20. You mean the Bible talks about that before it happened? 300 years before it happened. Talked about him. His bones would never be broken. And what happened when he died? Now, how did Jesus set that up? Now listen, when you get to me, don't hit me now. Hit me with that stick. My bones can't be broken because the scripture says, don't break. No, Jesus he didn't even say that to the Roman God. The Bible says when the God got to Jesus, he was already gone. He had, he, says he had already given up the ghost. So he had no conversation with the God to tell him, don't break my bones. He, they, the other two, they had to break their bones. But Jesus, when they got to him, he was already dead. He had already given up the ghost. So we see that Jesus also predicted his own death and resurrection in John 2. We saw that. So we see the reliability uh, of the maps. M stands for manuscripts. A stands for archaeology. P stands for prophecy. And the last one, statistics. S stands for statistics. And all we have to do is read that first verse, uh, first uh, sentence. Our fourth maps principle works well with the predictive prophecy because it is statistically preposterous that any or all of the Bible's very specific detailed prophecies could have been fulfilled through chance, good guessing, or deliberate deceit. Impossible. That's why it's amazing to me when I hear about a person today who claims to be the Messiah. When I hear Farrakhan says he is the Messiah. And, Fair, and, and Elijah Muhammad was the Holy Spirit. I see that, that bothers me. Yeah, that bothers me. Jim Jones could take a thousand people in 1980 and take them to Guyana and tell these people that he's God. And they believe him. That bothers me because none of these men has ever met any prophecy prediction. Where was uh, uh, Farrakhan born? Somewhere in the south in America. He wasn't born in Bethlehem. You see what I'm saying? These people don't mean no prophecies at all. And they call themselves the Messiah. They call themselves God. And they don't even meet not one prophecy in the Bible that concerns the birth, death, and resurrection of the real Messiah. But yet we got thousands and thousands of people following after these people. We're talking about them Sunday. But yet here this is statistically impossible for Jesus and anyone else to come up with this by chance or good guessing. We know that our Bible is reliable because we have these facts. We have them. Now, looking at the bottom of this page, now I get to ask you some questions, and we put it in question form. This is another article that I found. Look at question number one. Does the Bible claim to be uniquely inspired by God? And you got the scriptures right there. Yes. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. My question is this. If all scripture is inspired by God, how come churches don't use all scriptures? How come you can go to some churches and you can hear the preacher preach and actually preach verbatim what he's about to say? Because he preached that same message a thousand times. Because he only he only come you know our pastor he only preach out of John y'all already know that right my pastor only preach out of John he don't he don't go nowhere out of John because he that's out of his element what kind of foolishness somebody that's out of my pastor's element and he only stay in the book of John he says all scripture that means we have to go through all the scripture because all scripture is inspired by God Genesis through Revelation that's why we teach verse by verse. The reason we teach because we're going to go through everything. I, there's only pastor, I only know one pastor. There's a, several pastors out there that's doing it, but there's only one pastor that consistently has went through the Bible, preached through the New Testament at least. Took him out 30 years to preach through the New Testament. 30 years. So when he finally finished the New Testament uh, in the 30th year, he said he had to take a seven year sabbatical 
Because he said he had to go pray. He said, God, what do I do next? I preached the whole New Testament. And he said, or deep down, because you know, God didn't talk to him audibly, but he said he just felt uh, uh, through, through prayer, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, do it again. Because the same people that was there 30 years ago, probably not there. <laughs> they still gone. And guess what now you got? You got new insights. You got new illustrations to go over the same thing over and over again. As a matter of fact, Peter tells us to keep repeating the word. Keep repeating the word. Meaning going over it again. But if you never cross all of it, that's my pet peeve. When you got all kinds of preaching, you got all kinds of preaching. Uh, you got topical preachers, you got uh, preachers, subject preachers, but rarely do you have, watch this, expository preachers. Expository preaching is the way I preach. And the expository preaching was the number one way of preaching 200 years ago. Some of your uh, well-known preachers 200 years ago, most preachers preach expositorily, meaning this, they went verse by verse by verse. It's just recently in the 20th century that we change our styles of preaching and we take one verse out, out of the Bible, and guess what? We come up with a title, yeah, drop it like it's hot. I, can, I, need, I, need, I need a verse for that one, yeah. That, that, that'll make them shout right there. And a verse, and a verse ain't got nothing to do with drop it like it's hot. You just want you just wanted to say, yeah, yeah he's not to you know what are you talking about? Because the, the titles sound good. And, and so people run it with that because of the titles instead of listening to the scripture. And then the scripture has nothing to do with what he's preaching about. Uh, if you're a perfect example, is Resurrection Sunday. You're supposed to preach a sermon about Jesus rising. The preacher preached this message. He read the scripture where it says, and the angel rolled away the stone. Right? And the name of his sermon was Rolling Away the Stones in Your Life. Sound pretty good. Roll away the stone of doubt. Roll away the stone of guilt. He didn't mention the resurrection not once. He rolled away. Right, he rolled away. So he never mentioned. So it sounds good. Yeah, yeah roll away the stone of doubt. But that has nothing to do with keeping the text, keeping it in its context. What it really was meant, see this is expository preaching. Expository preaching is preaching for, preaching to people the way, the people who heard it first, the way they heard it. That's expository preaching. And then applying it to today. That's expository preaching. But by no means could you take John 3.16 and tell me John 3.16 got a hundred different, different meanings to it. It does not. Because we see that's what three, John three sixteen mean to you, but John three sixteen mean to me. No, see it doesn't work that way because the Bible is not subjective. The Bible is objective, meaning this: it means what it says, and it says what it means, and you can't change the meaning of it. Now you can try to apply it in many different ways, but for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son means just that. How could you come up with a whole different meaning with that? You can't. You can't interpret the Bible the way you want to and say, ah, oh, see, that's just for me. That's why we got cults. That's why we have a thousand churches in Detroit. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we have all these different religions. That's why we have all these cults. That's why we have them. It's because everybody want to interpret the Bible they want the way they want to interpret. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, I got a little chart in here about how people interpret the Bible, and you'll see that in a minute. Look at number uh, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. That's number two. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy, here's another one, of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its, own, had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So uh, the Bible is made up of 40 different writers. And every last one of them, whatever they wrote, they wrote by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Everything they wrote. That's why they agree. I, I, I used to tell this up, the other church I was in, uh, when you think you found a contradiction in the Bible, you didn't find a contradiction. You found a wrong interpretation. That's what you find. Because the Bible has to agree. you got to make it agree. If it don't agree, then your interpretation is wrong. I'll give you a perfect example. Scripture. Somebody found a scripture where, I mean, we used to, they used to teach this 
when I was growing up, that <laughs> when Jesus rose on the third day, that he went to heaven, sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat, and came back down. That's why when some people believe this, that when he rose, that he told Mary, told the woman, don't touch me, for I have yet not ascended to my father. So, watch the wrong interpretation. When they saw that verse, they immediately thought nobody touched Jesus before, after his resurrection. But then you got another scripture that says, they touched him. Now this is right after the resurrection. So who's wrong? Somebody's interpretation got to be wrong. Because someone said, ah, I found a contradiction in the Bible. No, you did not find a contradiction in the Bible. Let me explain to you what it means when Jesus said, touch me not. For I have not yet sent to my father. Meaning this, that verse or that phrase in the original Greek means this. Stop holding on to me. So once again, the agreement is there. The scripture was right where it says she grabbed his feet after the resurrection. And the scripture is correct when it says touch me not. Because touch me not or means stop holding on to me if they would have translated just that way. But when you look deep into the original Greek, too many people are looking for contradictions in the Bible and there are none. No contradictions whatsoever. So if you find one, then you have found a wrong interpretation. Go over that scripture or those two scriptures. That's why you got to go through all scripture. You got to take one, you can't take one verse and make a doctrine out of it. You can't do it. You got to go through the Bible, precept upon precept, book by book, to make sure that what you're saying is a doctrine is a doctrine. Yes. A problem for some people, yes. Uh, some translations, you have to be careful with some translations. You should make sure, and here's, here's how you know, you got two types of Bibles. You have paraphrase Bibles and you have study Bibles. Let me tell you the difference. A paraphrase Bible is a Bible like the Message Bible. That's a paraphrase Bible. This Bible I have is the John MacArthur Study Bible. If it says study Bible, well, I can't even say that now because I just thought about another Bible that says study Bible. It's not correct. So here, this is how you look at it. Okay. Paraphrase Bible means this. And that's why they call it paraphrase. The person who wrote or translated that particular Bible into his uh, own language wanted to paraphrase the Bible uh, in his English, the, the English that he speaks today. So you might use a lot of slang or something, but he's trying to stay true to the interpretation of the scripture. That's a paraphrased Bible. But a paraphrased Bible, like, uh, what's the Bible that uh, Creflo uses all the time? Uh, some of your charismatic churches, they use this, I'm trying to think, not the, the parallel, what's that, not the parallel Bible. Uh, uh, it's the P. Uh, but they use the Bible, it's a paraphrased Bible that they use, starting with a P, I'll think of it in a minute, but they use it all the time. But that paraphrased Bible is not, watch this, is not uh, really coming from the original Greek or the original Hebrew or the original Aramaic. It's actually coming from that person who wants to say, this verse to me, uh, I want to translate it this way. He's trying to make it so, as a matter of fact, I've never seen this Bible again before, but I remember I was like 20 years old, and I was at the Bible bookstore, and it was the Bible called, What's Up? Yes. I'm looking at this Bible. It said, Yo. God created the heaven. Yes. I, I don't know that Bible. Why is that bro? It's a paraphrase Bible. And that Bible went out of print real quick. Because guess what? Slang changes every day. I'll tell you some of the, I work in high school. I can tell you some of the slang terms these kids use that they used last year that they don't use this year. So if you're going to try to make a paraphrased Bible, tell about you're going to make an up-to-date English Bible, you are, you're probably making one every three years. And I think that's what they tried to do when they tried to make up a, I think it was a hip-hop Bible they tried to make. And you can't make a hip-hop Bible because the language changes every day. So that's what a paraphrased Bible. 
A study Bible is a Bible that in the beginning of the book, when you look at the beginning of it, you'll read this. In a study Bible, they would tell you, look at your Bibles, that it's been translated from the original Hebrew and Greek. That is a good study Bible. Let me name some names. I think the King James Study Bible is good. Uh, this Bible says it. This is the King James Bible. It says uh, uh, study Bible from John MacArthur, the original Greek uh, in Hebrew. Then you have somebody did a study Bible called the original Hebrew and Greek Study Bible. I think that's called the Key uh, Greek Study Bible. I have that one at home. So you have a lot of of Bibles, the life application is a study Bible. They'll tell you in the beginning. Jehovah's Witnesses, let's talk about them for a minute. When you pick up their Bible called the New World's Translation, when you open up the first page of their Bible, they tell you, they tell you nothing about the writers or the person who interpreted this particular Bible. No Greek, no Hebrew, no nothing. They don't give you any names of people who try to translate the original Hebrew and Greek into their translation today. They don't do that. That lets you know that that book has been interpreted by somebody on uh, whims and their own ways. They have no not really study the original Hebrew or Greek to find out what it originally says. So that's what you got to be careful what Sister Eli was saying about these different translations. As a matter of fact, some translations omit certain passages of Scripture. Uh, I'll give you one. Romans 12 and 1. Uh, Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. No, Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation until them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. In some translation, walk after the flesh and not after the spirit is taken out. Because they said this. Because uh, we don't find that in the original Greek and original Hebrew. And that may be true. But when you have 200 years of people uh, reading the King James Version Bible that has it in there, they're actually going to think that you are tampering with the Bible. If some manuscripts then, when they translated the King James Version Bible, had it in there, what makes you think that it's wrong to keep it in there? Because they said the majority of the manuscripts don't have it in there, so some Bible translations take it out. That'll mess somebody up. So, okay, I'm reading this in this Bible, and now it's not in this Bible. So that's why I tell you to stick with the King James Version. Uh, any other translation, I would say, is the New King James Version. And any other translation after that is the English Standard Version. Because those three Bibles stick with the original Hebrew and Greek translations of the Bible. All the other ones are paraphrased, parallel, all of them are paraphrased, especially the Message Bible. Uh, now, there's nothing wrong with the Message Bible. The person who wrote the Message Bible is Peterson. He was a pastor for 30 years, and he retired from pastoring. He decided to write books, and he began, he started, I remember when he started writing the Message. He only started with the books, the first five books, and it just got to the point where he finished the whole Bible in his own way. And we called it the Message Bible today. There's nothing wrong with reading it, but I would say read it on your own terms, but don't try to read it to try to get a deep understanding. Go back to the original Hebrew and Greek. Look at number two. What, what other evidence is there that the Bible is inspired by God? Supernatural change. The reason we know that the Bible is inspired by God because when folks get a hold to the real Bible, it changes their lives. When you get a hold of the real Bible here, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you turn your life over to him, it changes your life. Number B, fulfill prophecy. C, the Bible contains many prophecies recorded, and we already read some of those that later were fulfilled. We don't have to read those because we read those already. Uh, going down to, let's see, number three, because we read all of that. We studied all the other archaeological. We read that logical. Go to page seven. Number three, has it translated the Bible over and over ruined its reliability? No. And I told you the reason it did not ruin the reliability is because of the many manuscripts that were found. The more manuscripts we find, the more copies we find, the better the reliability is of the Bible. The less manuscripts that we have, then yeah, people can play with it. But you can't play with scripture and you can't mess up scripture if you got 10,000 and 20,000 copies of the Bible 
And all these are different writers. And they all agree with the same thing. You can't mess that up. And that's why, and you, I just told you, the Bible is the only book in the world that has that many, that many manuscripts found that's over 2,000, 3,000 years old. No other writing out there. As a matter of fact, let's talk about the Bible in print. The Bible in print today has put in print over, uh, I think they said, 3 to 4 billion copies to date. No other book. See, once again, all these copies. 4 billion copies of the Bible is out there somewhere. So who's, who ought to say that the Bible is not real uh, 500 years from now, from us, when we have all of these copies and copies? Who's going to try to mess up the translation when you have the copies? The more copies you have, the more people will find the right translation. That's how you translate between other copies. So once again, the Bible is the most printed book. It is the most reliable book because of the copies that are out there in print. Just to let you know, before the first century was over, there was over five, uh, I think they said over 2,000 copies of scripture in print. The Hebrew people, just the Old Testament alone, the Hebrew people made it their job because there was no printing press to have a certain group of people. All they did was copy books. Copy, copy, copy. Remember, I think, uh, was it in Joshua or one of the uh, books when one of the kings, well, first and second king, one of the kings, I think it was Josiah, found a copy of the law. He found the law. It was under a lot, it was under a lot of rubble because all they started worshiping idol gods. Here's an eight-year-old king. He started being king at eight years old. He finds a copy of the law and he begins to read it. When we say law, we talk about the first five books of the Bible. That's the law. He finds the copy of Moses writing and then he finds out that they're not doing as Hebrew people what they're supposed to do. He causes the whole nation of Israel to come together. I found the book that God wrote. Now, that wasn't the original book of Moses. That was a copy because they made it their business because this is hundreds and uh, 2,000 years after Moses. He found it. So there was copies of copies of copies of the law out there so people could find it and read it and line up with the Word of God. I don't know if you heard about this. Uh, this 1990, 1995, there were 2,000 Ethiopian Jews. So they say they were Ethiopian Jews. And uh, they went to Israel to get back into Israel and claim their heritage. Well, the Caucasian Israelites said, no, we're not going to let you in because you're not true Jews because you know, of your color of your skin. Well, they had a book, one of the copies of the law, as old as some of the manuscripts that I talked to you about. And they, they were practicing the law way better than the Jews that were practicing the law in Israel that are there today, and they let them in. This is back in 1995. And remember, Jews, after their dispersion, uh, when their nation was destroyed, they were dispersed all over the world. So that's why in Revelation when it says, when God is going to call the, the 144,000, no, it's not 145 Jew witnesses, no, it's not them. 12,000 out of each tribe of Israel and those 12,000 out of each tribe of Israel are, guess what, where are they dispersed? All over the world. I always tell people when they talk about Israel and they talk about the Jews in Israel, those are just the Caucasian Jews from Europe. All Jews that start up in Europe. They were running from Hitler. They were running from him. I remember him in the 40s. Those are Caucasian Jews. They are African Jews. They are Hispanic Jews. Jews. They are Asianic Jews. They are there because Jews have intermarried everybody on this planet. If you don't believe me, ask Moses. Moses married an Ethiopian woman. Uh, David married an African queen. Right? Solomon's mother was African. Uh, Ruth was from another country who married a Jewish man. So they intermarried over and over and over again. So stop looking at the skin color. He looked Jewish because his nose is long. See, no, we can't do that. You know, them Jews stingy, boy. You know, look at me. No, those are Caucasian.